Well, welcome to this panel, which is um, a transnational conversation among constitutional court judges. We have an unbelievably distinguished group with us, and I'm going to introduce them first, the people who are sitting on their courts still, uh, to my um, immediate right, Justice Rosalie Abela, who's a member of the Supreme Court of Canada. She went to the University of Toronto. She also graduated from the Royal Conservatory of Music and Classical Piano, uh, was called to the bar in 1972, and in 1976 she was appointed to the family court at the age of 29, the youngest and first pregnant person appointed to the judiciary in Canada. Uh, she led a very important royal commission on equality and employment in the 1980s, which had a huge impact not only on the jurisprudence in Canada, but on jurisprudence in many other countries around the world. She's written many articles and co-edited many books. And I probably will stop there, but I could keep going with all her distinguished visitor positions and honorary degrees and whatnots. All right, so that is Rosalia Bella. To her right, uh, far middle right, is um, Kuhn Lennart, who is the president, like the chief justice, of the Court of Justice of the European Union. For the American students in the room who are not familiar with it, the EU is about twice the population size of the United States. And this is the highest court of the EU, comparable to the United States Supreme Court. Um, uh, President Lennart's received both a Master of Laws and a Master of Public Administration from Harvard. Um, he got his PhD at Catholic University in Louvain. And he has had a distinguished career both as a professor, uh, as a member of the bar, where he, for a time, represented Belgium, if I remember correctly. He's been a visiting professor at this law school in the past. And he has served at multiple levels of the courts of the um, European Union, uh, most recently, and continuing as, um, as its president. So we are particularly honored uh, to have you with us. Now, we have three other equally distinguished guests, and I'm going to introduce next uh, Sandili Ngobo, who is to uh, President Leonard's right. Right and left are not my strong points. Um, uh, uh, Sandili Ngobo is the retired Chief Justice of the Constitutional Court of South Africa. His undergraduate degree was from the University of Zululand, his LLB from the University of Natal in Durban, and he received an LLM from Harvard in 1986. He practiced law, I think this period started before he came for the LLM, and it will interest you to know that his practice was interrupted for a year in 1976 under the apartheid regime when he was detained uh, uh, following a student uprising. He worked in a public interest law firm, trying civil and criminal cases involving issues including the forced removal of black communities to homeland, police torture and assault, wrongful detentions, and a variety of other important issues. After HLS, he spent a year as a clerk for Judge Higginbotham, if I've got it right, in the Third Circuit, uh, and was a teaching assistant in classes at Penn, Harvard Law School, and Stanford. I don't have time to give you all the details of his incredibly distinguished career, but he was appointed to the labor court bench in South Africa in the early 1990s, to the South Africa Truth and Reconciliation Commission in 1998, and in 1999, he was appointed Chief Justice of the Constitutional Court of South Africa, a position he held uh, until not 2011 when he retired. But since then, I think you've served as an acting judge of the, high, the Supreme Court of Namibia, yeah. um, which is a very interesting practice that, that happens in some other nations. All right, now, to Justice Abela's immediate right is uh, Dieter Grimm, a former member of the Constitutional Court of Germany and a regular visiting professor of law at Yale Law School. I know I'm not Sorry supposed to, to mention it, <laughs> but I actually went to Yale Law School, so I have an exemption from that rule. Um, um, professor Grimm is also a professor of law at Humboldt University in Berlin and a permanent fellow and former director of the Wissenschaftskolog zu Berlin Institute for Advanced Study. Um, he was a justice of the Constitutional Court from 1987 to 1999. He's an honorary member of the American Academy of Arts and Sciences, holds law degrees from Frankfurt and a master's from Harvard, uh, author of many books and articles, including a quite recent and fascinating book, 
about the past, present, and future of constitutionalism. Uh, he's been a visiting professor at many schools, in, in addition to Harvard, including NYU, Toronto, Rome. I can't go through the list, and holds honorary degrees from a number of universities. And finally, my friend Manuel Jose Cepeda Espinosa, who is sitting next to Professor Tushnet, is currently the president of the <laughs> International Association of Constitutional Law. He was president and a justice of the Colombian mm -hmm. Constitutional Court from 2001 until 2009. He played an important role in making the 1991 Constitution as an advisor to the president for the Constituent Assembly and constitutional drafting. He was also a presidential advisor for legal affairs for uh, the prior president of the Republic, Regilio Bargo. Fargus. He has written extensively on Colombian constitutional law and the impact of the 1991 Constitution. Uh, he taught constitutional law at and was dean at Universidad de los Andes, uh, from which he holds a law degree, and he also holds an LLM from Harvard. Uh, he continues to be affiliated with the Universidad de los Andes as a member of the board of directors and director of the program on public policy regulation and constitutional law. And he has served as a consultant on peace process matters, which those of you who follow Colombia know have been of great interest in public attention in the last three to five years or longer. So this is our wonderful panel. And the way Professor Tushnet and I plan to do this is really as a conversation. So Professor Tushnet and I will ask questions. And then we hope to leave maybe 20 or 30 minutes at the end for questions from the audience. Um, I want to say to our panel, because we haven't rehearsed, at, uh, of course, <laughs> that you are not obligated to answer any of the questions. Um, or if you think the question isn't quite right, you're welcome to change it and answer the question you think we should have asked instead. We do that all the time. Uh, right. I, but I just wanted to make clear that you were invited to do so. So uh, do you want to start, Mark, with the first question, or do you want me to? Why are you starting? All right. So um, first question goes something like this. Constitutional courts function as government organs in political contexts involving no surprise, other organs of government, and a public audience. So the big picture question is, what kind of challenge does this setting pose for the court you know best? Uh, and maybe th then there are some follow-on questions uh, that might relate to the rise of populism in various countries. But maybe we'll start with the big picture, and then you can adjust it as you like. Who would like to go first? Justice Abela, and then we'll just go down the row. Does that sound good? See, when you're the only person on the panel who doesn't have a Harvard degree, you really have a lot to show for. Right? <laughs> so um, I'm going to speak uh, as someone who is on a constitutional court that is really enjoying a very peaceful moment. And I say that with enormous gratitude to those who are doing it in more turbulent environments. Um, we had, during the 90s, I have to say, the um, difficulty of judging in the rhetorical turbulence that was the product of a supply side of invectives from the United States that breathe the fumes of judicial activism and politicization, words we had never heard in Canada before. But we've survived it, and we are now doing what I think all courts, constitutional courts, are supposed to do, and we are not government actors. We are there uh, with a constitution which we didn't pass. The government said to us, by passing a constitution and a charter of rights and freedoms, your responsibility is to determine whether what we do passes constitutional muster. So the notion of judicial activism is something I've never understood. We're doing our job. And if you don't like the result, you can call it judicial activism. But it is judges doing what judges do. So what do we do? Well, we always in Canada, um, when we're assessing rights, do it knowing that there are several audiences. One is the government, one is the public, one is other judges, one is lawyers, one is scholars. And we don't have a particular constituency in mind, but I have. And the one I think about always is history. How will history judge this decision? Will it say this was a decision with integrity? 
Is this a decision that's rigorous? Is this a decision that made sense for its time? Um, whether you are the dissent or the majority judgment. But because we are doing this with the benefit of something which many other courts don't have, and particularly the American court, uh, and that is a section one which says all rights are guaranteed subject only to such reasonable limits as are justified in a free and democratic society. We have a directive from our constitution that says weigh it, balance it. Uh, what is uh, the benefit of the right versus the harm of the uh, infringement? We borrowed proportionality from the German Constitutional Court, and it is so much easier than an American Constitution which hasn't got the balancing provision and takes an absolutist approach to many of the rights, particularly freedom of speech, which has become the new religion here. It's a bit scary to somebody from a tradition that sees limits on, on some speech. Um, so we can engage in that proportionality exercise in every single one of our rights. So how does it interact with the government? The claimant, the complainant, proves the breach. The government then has the onus of showing why it's a justified breach. That means sometimes the government is going to win, sometimes the government is going to lose. When the government wins, they like it better. When the government loses, um, then they're not happy with it. But we're not. The worst that happens to us in a country like Canada, the luxurious country of Canada, is we get a nasty editorial. There are some countries where your, I mean, you will hear from some of them, where your physical security is endangered. Israel, the Chief Justice of Israel, had 24-hour security when he was on the, on the Supreme Court of Israel. So we make decisions. We risk unpopularity. Unpopularity is what judges are supposed to be able to risk. We are the non-majoritarian institution. Governments have to respond to the public to the majority of the public. We can take what we think the majority of the public has in mind. We are not bound by it. We are the place where minorities can come to have their rights vindicated with no risk except controversy. And you know, uh, Edith Wharton in An Age of Innocence said Mrs. Manson Mingott determined what the right thing to do was. Well, courts don't have that. So public opinion. I mean, there are mood swings. It's not tested by evidence. We don't worry about what public opinion is. We listen to the arguments. We listen to the evidence. We hope that time will judge it to have been the right decision. So thank you. OK. <coughs> Professor Grimm. Uh, well, I think in Germany, <coughs> uh, government and parliament are not always happy with the decisions that the Constitutional Court takes. <coughs> And this is normal. Uh, I think that uh, something would be wrong with the court uh, if the other branches of government were always pleased with what the court uh, uh, does. Uh, still, I couldn't re report of any case uh, of open non-compliance of the government with court decisions. Uh, and this is so uh, in spite of the fact that the German court is a quite active court. I make the difference mm -hmm. between activism and pessimism. I, no, I, I can only make it after comparing various courts. Mm -hmm. uh, uh, before I started to compare courts, I didn't know that my court was an active court. <laughs> uh, but now I know it uh, from comparing. Uh, and uh, uh, more active than the US Supreme Court, although, if I may say so, less politicized than the US Supreme Court. More active, to give you one example, uh, the court uh, understands fundamental rights, civil rights, not only as negative rights, obliging the government to refrain from certain actions that would uh, be a violation of fundamental rights, but also as positive rights, that's to say, as imposing duties on government to act if fundamental rights, if freedom are endangered from private actors, so the government is then obliged and the Constitutional Court obliges the Parliament to regulate certain problems that stem from private action that endangers fundamental rights. So we are in a rather privileged position, and one has to be aware of the fact that this 
can always change. And uh, I say this in order to mention that we have, uh, in my view, a dramatic setback with regard to compliance of governments with constitutional courts. We have it even in the European Union, 27 member states uh, uh, who, in order to become a member of the European Union, have to be democratic, have to be comply with the rule of law, have to respect fundamental rights. But there is a lot of court pecking and court curbing going on in the world and also in the European Union. The Polish Constitutional Court is almost paralyzed after a number of reforms. Uh, the Hungarian Constitutional Court is after pecking is in line with the government. The government has not to fear anything from that Constitutional Court anymore. So we have to be aware this is, uh, if things are as they are up to now in Germany, this is an achievement that can by no means be taken for granted. And the question, of course, is can courts do anything about that? I mean, after having been pecked, after having been paralyzed, there's little to do for courts. Uh, they may not even want to do anything about it, but in the short intermediate time, can courts do something about it? And uh, I pose a question without giving the answer, but maybe we have a chance to discuss it later. Is there a justification in such a situation where courts are endangered? Is there a justification for courts not to render a judgment as the Constitution in their best knowledge would require it, but render a different judgment in order to save the institution? Very interesting question that I hope will be taken up. We'll hear next from President Lennartz. Well, thank you, Vicky. Uh, I have the advantage to speak after the two first speakers because uh, I can fully subscribe to what they have said, also in relation to the proper scope of activity of the Court of Justice of the European Union. I should clarify for the audience that the European Union is a common governance structure for 28, soon to be 27 member states, <laughs> at the same time uh, a common legal order. And it is the task of the Court of Justice of the European Union to ensure the uniform interpretation, application, and enforcement of union law. This is simply required in order to guarantee the equality of all the member states and their peoples before the common law, before union law. And on the other hand, the second function, it must ensure the constitutionality of all the law of the union with the primary law of the union. And I see some students now look at constitutionality. He uses the word constitution. Yes, because the foundational treaties of the union, as well as the Charter of Fundamental Rights of the European Union, the Bill of Rights in the US, form what the French call so beautifully le bloc constitutionnel, the constitutional block on which the union is based. So that is our ultimate rule of reference, rule of recognition, to quote another Harvard uh, scholar, <coughs> a rule of recognition vis-a-vis -vis which we will um, uphold the legality of all what is happening in the European Union. Now, this is a system of what Lawrence Streich would call separated and divided powers. So we have uh, the principle of conferral, that's the EU speak for the principle of attributed powers, of enumerated powers, principle of enumerated powers. So we must always stay within the confines of the competences conferred to the Union. And of course, we draw the lines. It's a line drawing exercise between the Union and the member states, between the several Union institutions interacting through a subtle system of checks and balances, which we call the principle of institutional balance. So all these types of litigation are submitted to us, but this is done on express competence conferred to our court in the treaties. So in other words, we hadn't the need for a Marbury versus Madison judgment because the equivalent of Marbury versus Madison is simply written in the full text of the Constitution. It says that we have the competence to control the constitutionality of the laws made. So that makes it easier. However, it also means 
that since the legislative areas in which the union is becoming active are ever increasing, not because of the union itself, but because of the member states, which as masters of the treaties, that is of the constitution, are conferring ever more powers in ever broader fields to the European Union, including in cases uh, as asylum and immigration, uh, criminal law, family law matters, whenever there is a cross-border element, conflict of laws, conflicts of jurisdiction, all sorts of fields which are far remote from the common market, from the commerce clause, you would say here. So it's law in general. And it means that we are involved in all those fields. It is now fair to say that we are handing down judgments in all the delicate and sensitive constitutional law areas in which the US Supreme Court is active. Mm -hmm. And this more or less simultaneously, religion in the workplace, race and ethnic origin in the worst workplace, handicap in the workplace as forbidden grounds of discrimination, sexual orientation, all these matters are included. We have now a same-sex marriage case pending in our court. Why? A Romanian national marries a US national in Belgium, where same-sex marriage is allowed. This while the Romanian man was working as a migrant worker in Belgium. Now he's returning home because he got a better job offer in his home state, Romania. <coughs> they refuse to recognize the same-sex marriage as being contrary to the Romanian constitution. Ever heard about Obergefell versus Ohio? <laughs> <laughs> the terms of the debate is Roberts against Kennedy. Eh? That's Kennedy for the majority, five. Roberts for the minority, dissent, four. That's what I mean. We are a court doing that. So we have all the sensitive sensitivity of constitutional law adjudication pertaining to any jurisdiction. We have good textual guidance, like in the Canadian case. What, what you said about this balancing and proportionality, it's all in our text as well, fortunately enough. But all the same, even taking all of that into account, we must be very, very cautious. Do the job, being active, yet not activist. And we are in a context of very great diversity between these member states. Bigger diversity, I would suggest, than, for instance, in the United States. So we must accommodate that in order to keep the law uniform, to keep the constitutional standards uniform, at least at the basic level, indicate what member states can do separately according to their own choices. And keeping that balance is the big challenge for our court. The final point is, I think we can do it. We are expressly mandated or charged with that task by the member states as her and der Verträge, masters of the treaties. But we do it always with a concern to avoid becoming a player. We are an umpire. We may not be seen as, an, as a player in a pluralistic political debate. So we are an umpire. We listen to all the arguments, like Rosalia Bella said, to all the arguments, and it's the strongest legal argument which wins. And we make single judgments, no dissenting opinions, to have a final say of the law, which will thereafter be the law of the land in the whole of the European Union. It's not our choice not to have dissents. <coughs> It's in the text. It's also in the text of the Constitution. The judgments must be consensual in order to have the capacity to be recognized as the final authority. Thank you very much. Uh, Chief Justice Ngoba? Thank you. If I had my way, I would simply say I associate myself with everything that my colleagues have said. But I do want, though, to to raise another aspect 
from the South African perspective, I think there's always an inherent difficulty in trying to serve a multiplicity of masters, the public, the government, NGOs, and everyone else. So as a court, we decided to take a conscious decision to serve only one master, and that is the Constitution. And I think the attitude of the South African government, the public towards the constitutional <laughs> court must be understood against the background of why the constitutional court was established in the first place. Prior to 1994, we had a judiciary that was dedicated, with a few exceptions, to the enforcement of apartheid legal order and its policy. <coughs> when there was a political change in 1994, one of the crucial questions that as a nation we had to ask was, who can we entrust? with the guardianship of the Constitution. Can we trust judges who, for most of their judicial lives, have been involved in enforcing apartheid laws? Secondly, we were dealing also with a thoroughly unrepresentative judiciary which was composed of, I think at the time, probably about 98% white male with one or two women at the time. There were no Africans or blacks who served in that court. So that's the reality that we, was, we were faced with. And it was against that background that a decision was taken to establish a new court with no ties to the past with no baggage from the past, which we can then entrust with the enforcement of the new constitution. It is the newness of the court that defined the relationship between the court and the political branches of government and the public. Right at the very beginning, one of the very tough cases that the court had to face was to strike down what the most popular president had done, President Mandela. We struck down laws that he had made which permitted a delegation, where he delegated power to the provinces. And the court held, you can't do that and we will tell you what you should have done. The very same evening, when the court rendered the judgment, he went on public radio and television to, con to commit himself to adhering to the judgment of the court. <coughs> A couple of years later, he, he was also faced with a difficulty. A high court judge had asked him to appear before it in order to give evidence, often concerning a commission of an inquiry that he had appointed. It, the, the commission of inquiry had to do with problems in the rugby football. The public which included myself at the time, we were dead against that. We just couldn't understand why this old, this judge from the old order would call upon our president to go and appear in court in circumstances where this was a reactionary litigation because they simply didn't want any investigations 
to be conducted into the Rohingya. President Mandela was the first one to say he will go to court and he will give evidence. So that, in a sense, set the tone for how government and the political branches of government were going to react to court decisions. The other important factor that must also be taken into account is the enormous power that the Constitutional Court has. It has the power to deal with any dispute that raises a constitutional matter. Now, if you are a constitutional democracy subject to a constitution, it is difficult to fathom any dispute which will not raise a constitutional issue. So from that standpoint, the powers of the constitutional court on the face of it appear to be somewhat unlimited. And what is more, the Constitution itself give it enormous powers in the sense that it has the power to decide what many in other countries would regard as a political question, such as a dispute concerning the status and the powers of the various spheres of government. We can consider the constitutionality of the bill. We can strike down a bill, we can strike down any law and make any order that we consider just and equitable in the circumstances. It is precisely the exercise of that power which has more recently changed the attitude of government. What has been happening over the last couple of years is that the court has increasingly been drawn into issues that are so politically controversial, raises profound issues of political morality, which were considered to be traditionally the no-go zone for courts. That's where the court has been dragged into, including the squabbles between polit among political parties. Okay. It is precisely the, when we exercise the jurisdiction that has incurred on occasion the wrath of the government, where you are beginning to see somehow a slight change in the attitude where they will criticize the court, say all kinds of things. Okay. And <clears throat> however, whatever they may say in public, they have always respected the decisions of the court. And for us, that's important because it is only if the government, which is charged with the responsibility of implementing our decision, that we can be comfortable in the job that we're doing, that democracy and constitutionalism will be protected. Okay. But regrettable, you know, if one looks across the continent, the picture is not that good. More recently, for example, there were elections in Kenya, presidential elections. There were problems with those elections the matter went to the Supreme Court. The Supreme Court invalidated those elections. This drew criticism from the politicians. There were newspaper reports indicating that judges were referred to as thugs and as crooks. That's what the reporters were saying. <laughs> On Thursday this week, there was supposed to be a rerun of those elections. But on the eve of, this, of these re-elections, an urgent matter was brought to the Supreme Court again to postpone the elections because the opposition parties took the view that 
there were things that sh had not yet been uh, rectified so as to create an atmosphere that would be conducive to fair, to free and fair elections. Now, reports coming from that country indicates that the day before, a bodyguard of the Deputy Chief Justice was shot at. The following day, when the Supreme Court was ready to hear the matter, four judges did not turn up. As a result, there was no quorum, and <clears throat> the Supreme Court could not hear the matter. I'm citing this example simply to illustrate how attacks on the judiciary, how anything that tends to undermine the judiciary may frustrate constitutionalism. These elections were intended to allow the people to exercise their right to vote, elect their own leaders. But they've been frustrated because the judges did not turn up. As a result, there was no litigation. So I'm citing this just to make the point. And as my colleague from, uh, from, from, from Germany made the point, I mean, it's just not confined to, to Africa. In Germany, and in Hungary, as he has pointed out. And in this country, too, when federal courts started to strike down some of these travel bans, that drew criticism. So it's not a question of it can't happen with us. It will. It's a question of time. And the real question is, what, needs to, what can judges do in order to protect themselves against these kind of things. <clears throat> it is all good. At least we can pride ourselves in South Africa in the sense that our constitution protects the judiciary by guaranteeing our independence and calling upon the branches of government to take every step necessary in order to protect our in independence and to, to make sure that our judgments are effective. So that, in a sense, has a way of capping the excesses of the political branches of government. Because if they do anything that is calculated to undermine the judiciary, that would be a violation of the Constitution. Shall I stop there for the time being? <laughs> for the time being, but that's fascinating, and I see that you've picked up the question that Dieter put on the table. But we'll now hear from um, uh, Professor Cepeda, uh, uh, and then uh, we'll give you a chance to ask each other questions, if you would like, before we go on to the next round. Thank you, Vicky. It has been fascinating listening to the different perspectives. I come from Colombia, where the Constitutional Court lives per permanently in the eye of Hurricane Katrina, Maria, Jose, all the hurricanes come every month to the Constitutional Court. And so the questions that have been put, <laughs> how can a court at the same time protect the Constitution and protect rights, take into account the force of the political context that is discussing issues that are arriving to the court, not one year, two years, three years later, but at the moment the discussion is going on in the political context. And the third is a court whose only power is to write a piece of paper. That is the power of the court, <laughs> to write a piece of paper. How can the court manage to do her job and survive? So this is the, the, big, the big question <laughs> for the Colombian Constitutional Court. And this question must be, at least in our context, is addressed taking into account the following problems. The first problem is structural failures in the state and in the political process. What do I mean for that? Is that the state is not representative enough. 
a lot of Colombians feel that Congress does not represent them or does not listen to them. Second, a state that has a precarious capacity to do things. So the 1990, 1991 Constitution promises that everyone would have a right to health. But the state does not have the capacity to do that. So how can the court interpret a constitution that promises that, a state that does not have the capacity to deliver, but citizens that go to the court asking for the court to interpret the constitution? How to handle that? Third problem, very critical yes. one, a very unequal society, <coughs> very unequal society with exclusion, uh, uh, discrimination, marginalization, and a political system that is not responsive to that. Mm. So this is, a, and secondly, big, big, big structural problem, uh, political forces that are not always uh, respectful of the rule of law. <laughs> In this context, the questions that have been put, how does a court manage, are very, very important. But in Colombia, we have Fortunately, a paradox. We have a, this context, but at the same time, we have a stable legal tradition and constitutional tradition of judicial review. So our Marbury versus Madison case was 130 years ago, in 1887. Uh, we have abstract judicial review of the constitutionality of statutes approved by Congress through Axio Popularis since 1910. So 120 years of, act of effective judicial review of legislation in abstract judicial review. So that has given to the court a traditional legitimacy to be in the eye of the hurricane and take very difficult decisions. <coughs> But in addition, the court has tried to um, combine two very important elements for the sustainability of judicial review. The first, already mentioned, is do your job of protecting rights. When the times arrive that there is going to be a rebellion of the political process against a very unpopular decision or against a series of very unpopular decisions, First protection is whether the people feel protected by the court or not. So when I was in the court, there was, for, excuse me, the anecdote, there was a, a, an attempt to curtail the powers of the court. And there was a constitutional amendment introduced to Congress to curtail the powers of the court. What can the court do there? Well, nothing. <laughs> what happened was that people of different uh, characteristics, try to protect the court. And it was a very moving, moving moment in which people went to the streets of all kind, even indigenous peoples that m marched <laughs> from the provinces to Bogota to surround the court and say to Congress, you cannot touch this court because this court protects our rights. It's doing her job. That's very important, very important. So the second element that I think protects the court <laughs> is if the court is open, and this is very controversial, right? it's open to um, a kind of remedy, to adopt a remedy that allows the political process to discuss the remedy. So, you are in the eye of the hurricane, you render the decision, but you don't impose an absolute decision forever on the country. <laughs> you protect the Constitution, and you allow the political process to perhaps think about the solution. I mentioned one example. I mentioned one example. And we call it this way. It shouldn't be called this way, but this is the way it was called in the Constitution. Euthanasia. The, court, the Constitutional Court in the 90s decided that the voluntary termination of life was a right protected by autonomy and dignity. 
in a Catholic country. <laughs> you can imagine, in a Catholic country. So that generated a huge discussion. Most of the discussion was against the court. How could the court allow for that? Initiatives for referendum were there. Debates in Congress were going on. And it lasted for years. But in the end, there was no amendment to the Constitution to overrule the court. And the preferences in the political process, in the, in the political opinion, evolved. And now in Colombia, most Colombians accept that there is a right to decide whether to terminate your own life if you are a terminally ill patient. Because the court did not impose an absolute remedy. It rendered a decision and opened up for the political process to, to, to act and to react. The test case of sustainability for me was the presidential reelection case. It was a case in which we had a very popular president, always 70% of popularity, that decided that he wanted to be reelected. And so amended the constitution to be reelected immediately. It was also the government that had pushed for restricting the powers of the court. So the court it decided that, I will not go into the details of this, decision, decided that one re-election, but only one re-election was allowed. Otherwise, it would be unconstitutional. It would be an unconstitutional constitutional amendment. That's a tough, <laughs> tough thing, but <laughs> that's another topic. So only one re-election is allowed. Of course, the president was happy. <laughs> the president. He didn't realize that it was only one. It means the only one. So after being re-elected once, he said, OK, I'm still 70%. Let's try it again. Let's go for the second re-election amendment. And, and then the court, a new court, I was not in the court at the time. I was in the first, said, OK, remember that we had said only once. And so stroke down as unconstitutional the second re-election amendment. And the president, 70% of popularity, that had a chance to participate in the election of the court that just stroke down the second re-election amendment, said, OK, I abide by it. So I think this is a test on how to navigate in the eye of the hurricane. Thank you very much. This was fascinating. We actually have a list of six questions, which we're clearly not going to get to. But what I thought we might do is ask each of the any of the panelists who want to have a one minute comment on anything anybody else said, and I will enforce it, and my students in the room know that I actually put my little alarm on. So, <laughs> but, but I thought that if anybody had a comment on what any of the colleagues had said, here's a shot at it. And then the next round we'll do more quickly. Comments? Justice Abela, I could see you taking notes furiously. Uh, I just want to make an observation, if I can. I mean, it is, for all of us, inconceivable that we would not look to what each other does in constitutional adjudication, not to be bound by it, but to learn from it. And I, I have to say, once again, just listening to my colleagues talk about their perspectives, um, I have trouble understanding an approach to constitutional decision making that operates on the premise that what other countries and courts are doing are not relevant. Or do you think there's been a debate about this no, anywhere? Somebody <laughs> told me. <laughs> somebody told me. So you learn. You learn from what other countries do. You can agree. You can disagree. Say a Berlin said there's no pearl without some irritation in the oyster. So you may find yourself really offended by what another country does, but you may find a good idea because we're all in the same business. And we all have constitutions that set out rights. And it's useful to see what other countries do in assessing rights in their own context, in their own context. I also want to say I'm totally intimidated because the three constitutional scholars for whom I have the most time and respect are Vicki Jackson, Frank Tush, Mark Tushnet, and Frank Michaelman, and they're all here, and I feel like I'm writing an exam. <laughs> very, very well. And, he, and he, you know, one, I'm going to make a, just a brief comment. We heard from both, um, uh, especially uh, Chief, uh, Chief Justice uh, uh, Ngobo and, and uh, 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 President uh, Sebeda, um, the importance of the role of political figures and the decisions of people in the government to comply 
to uphold or to threaten. Um, and both of those are relevant, I think, to the question that uh, Professor Grimm put, which is if you start to see the signs of threats to courts or to constitutionalism, are there measures that can be taken? Mm -hmm. uh, 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 Chief uh, President Lennartz mentioned some very sensitive issues involving gender and religion mm. in the workplace, which mm. might be particular points of worry. So let me throw that out, but ask you folks to keep your comments relatively short so that we have time to get to the audience. Who wants to go next? Yes. <laughs> I made it within <laughs> my... Well, I'm not the <laughs> Hello. <laughs> Two ways of dealing with exactly that is issue, Vicky. First of all, we are courts, meaning that we decide cases. It is very important to decide one case at a time. I'm paraphrasing Cass Sunstein's article. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. That's more important when the, the more sensitive the issues are. You should strictly stay in the confines of what the judicial office is being entrusted with to decide. Case or controversy, stay in your case. No obiter dicta, no developments, not saying we should now deal with the matter globally. So when we get often comments on our jurisprudence from academic circles or other circles, this judgment leaves more questions open than it answers. And that's usually meant as a criticism. When I read that, I say, fantastic, <laughs> job well done. <laughs> so that's the first means. The second means is, come to the core of the reasoning, which can support the operative part of the judgment, the core of the legal reasoning, and that should set the limits within which the political process takes it up again from there. It's exactly what President Cepeda said. I recognize myself and the way of doing of our court constantly. There is an interaction between the judicial process and the political process. We have now, for instance, in our court, difficult cases pending on the so-called social dumping. That is, I'll save you the details, it's a whole mechanism of posted workers which come from Central and Eastern Europe to work into Western Europe, and this while they're still affiliated to the social security coverage of their country of origin, which tends to be only one-fifth of the cost of the affiliation in the west of Europe. And that, of course, is distorting uh, competition within the internal market. The question then arises, should that be validated in all circumstances, or if there is, if there is evidence of fraud, can we then say that the normal mechanism does not come into play. We have to rule about these cases in the limited context of a fraud case, as the case is brought to us. We will say what we have to say, the case is pending, but it will center on that core issue, and whatever we say will be a new impetus for the political process to take it from there. But I can tell you that the European Commission said we are now waiting on that social security affiliation matter, the judgment of the court, because that might bring us together to find the necessary qualified majority on that issue in the council thereafter. It's a beautiful interaction of the judicial and the political process. Thank you. I, I, Dieter, I see you wanted to get in briefly. I've got I, my I timer. Think, <laughs> I think I would distinguish two scenarios. Scenario one is you can be sure if you deviate once from the Constitution, you will afterwards be in a position to continue on the normal basis. Mm -hmm. In this case, mm -hmm. I would find a justification to act like this. Only this is the most unlikely scenario. The likely scenario is that you cannot be sure. Yeah. You cannot mm -hmm. be sure. And if you, in that case, where you cannot be sure that it, you will uh, uh, reach your purpose. If then you deviate from the Constitution, you contribute mm -hmm. to the delegitimization mm -hmm. of the court and the Constitution. Yeah. So I think the normal answer under normal conditions is you should not do it. Thank you. Uh, what are abnormal conditions? A normal, condi normal condition is that generally the government will comply with what the court says. Yeah. Yeah. 
Oh, we're still within our time. Thank you. Uh, Sunday. Yeah. Yeah. I think Manuel has raised a, a, a question that often uh, troubles me, and that is, you know, the one thing that uh, political branches of government fear the most is the public because they get into power through the votes of the public. If they no longer have the support of the public, they're most likely to get out of power. Here's the question. And the judges, too, need confidence of the public in their work so that at least that con public confidence in the judiciary can, in a sense, act as a check on how mm -hmm. the political branches of government mm -hmm. react to the decisions of the court. I, something tells me that perhaps there may well be a nuanced difference between public support on the one hand and public confidence in the judiciary. I will stop there. Okay, thank you. <laughs> but perfect timing. If I could, if I could get my, if I could, uh, I'm, I'm learning, as my students know, I'm learning to control this thing. Uh, should, Mark, do you want to take over with one or two questions and ask for short? Well, let's do short responses so then we can get to the audience. Okay, maybe three minute yeah, responses. So I'd like to pick up on something that uh, Justice uh, Bella mentioned, uh, which is and and sort of generalizes a bit, which is in her version the. Um, U.S. aversion to referring to other uh, countries' constitutional jurisprudence. And the more general version is that in the United States, uh, and I'm asking this of you as people who have been or are or have been constitutional court judges, in the United States we think that it's important for judges to have a more or less self-conscious theory of constitutional interpretation. Mm -hmm. uh, uh, the questions we distributed mentioned originalism, but it doesn't really matter what the theory is. We seem to think that having a theory of interpretation is important. You can probably tell by my tone of voice that I'm skeptical about that, but I would like to see what you have to say about sort of what do you, what do, you do when you're interpreting, the, interpreting your constitution? And, and one, one just side point, not a related point, is um, the, the need to reach a decision without dissent that uh, mm -hmm. the European uh, ECJ uh, seems to me to be an incredible constraint mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. on, I would say, the coherence of, uh, of decisions. So anybody can react mm -hmm. to that. <coughs> Want to go down the table coming this way since we went that way to start with Manuel and come down? Okay. Thank you. Yes, it's a, a very tough question. I would say that, at least in, a, in my jurisdiction, we have a consensus on certain elements, but it was a consensus that was difficult to reach. <coughs> in the sequence, I would uh, summarize the issues. The first one, originalism. The first uh, point was a rebellion of the constitutional court against originalism. Why? because the Constitutional Court was created in 1991 by a constituent assembly whose members were alive. Mm. So the court said, it's not the delegates of the assembly that will tell me what's the meaning of such <laughs> article of the Constitution. It's myself, and I will interpret the Constitution as a judge. So it was a way to strike an independence from the authors of the Constitution that were alive. So originalism died very quickly. <laughs> so originalism died out. Second uh, uh, is the court then had to discuss how to interpret promises of the Constitution that were difficult to enforce. Right to health for everybody. <laughs> what to do in, in Colombia for right to health for everybody? Very difficult. So the court basically, after a lot of discussion, accepted that some social rights could be enforced judicially case by case after a huge debate. And the way to do it at the beginning was, and we will come back to that, was when there is a connection to an obvious fundamental right. Let's say, the right to life. If the threat to health is so big that the right to life is at stake, 
social rights are going to be enforced. That was the beginning of another topic that perhaps we will discuss afterwards. The second basic, big issue was, how are you going to interpret the Constitution in a civil law country when the Constitution uh, is open to several interpretations? Do precedents have a role to play? It, should we, shall we go beyond the text? And so the court said, yes. <laughs> we, we cannot uh, pretend not to look to precedents, even if we are from a civil law tradition. So that the second element, uh, third element of consent. Then, since we have abstract judicial review for such a long time, let's say since 1910, we had an approach to judicial review of legislation that was just in the abstract, a comparison of two texts, the text of the law and the text of the Constitution. Very, uh, let's say, very formalistic and logic. Proportionality was not allowed. <laughs> but then, after a huge debate, the court accepted proportionality. So we, we have a consensus now on proportionality. Then came a very tough point, which is this one is. Can the tough one wait until the next round? Oh, yeah, yeah sorry, sorry. <laughs> sorry. <laughs> Okay. I, let me, I, well, I'm working on it. Would you like to? <laughs> <laughs> okay. uh, how, how much time do I have? Three minutes. <laughs> Three minutes? She's, she's going to use the hook. You know. <laughs> okay. I think I'm going to send a text message. <laughs> One, our approach has tried to steer away, far away, from the concept of originalism. When we interpret the Constitution, we are concerned about what does the text mean? <coughs> what is the purpose that this particular provision of the Constitution serves? <coughs> what assists us in ascertaining the meaning of the text? We look at the context. And the context is not just limited to the other provisions of the Constitution, but it goes beyond that. It looks at legislative history, for example. It looks more fundamentally at our history. And I think what informs our constitutional interpretation are the national goals that we have fashioned for ourselves in the Constitution, as well as the fundamental principles that have been established by the Constitution in order to facilitate the achievement of those goals. The Constitution makes it quite clear that it is a transformative Constitution, which seeks to transform South African society from what it was during the apartheid time to a very new society, one that's characterized by respect for human dignity, <coughs> fundamental human rights, and social justice. And in order to facilitate the achievement of these goals, the Constitution in the very first provision establishes foundational values that will facilitate the achievement of those goals. One of those is the supremacy of the Constitution and the rule of law. The importance of that is that it enables the courts to strike down any legislation or conduct that is inconsistent with the Constitution so as to carry on the, pro the constitutional project of transforming the society. That is what informed. And if you look at our jurisprudence, time and again, we refer to the goals that we're fashioned for ourselves, the Constitution, as well as the fundamental principles. Happily in South Africa, we need not excavate beneath the text in order to find those principles. They are set out in the Constitution. Sorry, sorry. Thank you very much. Um, <laughs> President Well, Lamar. I can draw on what has just been said uh, for the Court of Justice of the European Union. The main method of interpretation is indeed text, context, and objectives. 
Now, text and context, that's exactly like the Chief Justice uh, said, so I don't have to dwell upon it. We didn't have much preparatory works, but that is now changing because of this Convention on the Future of Europe, which was in fact uh, running as the preparatory um, gremium for the Lisbon version of the present treaties on which the European Union is based. So we have something. But the important thing is the objectives. And here, contrary to common wisdom, that it is either textual interpretation, also in this country, originalists, huh? sort of the original intent and close to the text, etc. Opposite is then teleological, the telos, the purposive interpretation, etc. In European Union law, the two, and I'm going to astonish you, almost coincide. Why? A bit like what you said about South Africa. The purposes for which the Union has been created are spelled out up front in the treaties as such and in each competence conferred on the European Union. In other words, the European Union is not a goal in itself. It is a means to reach the policy goals which member states have entrusted because they were aware of the fact that they could not themselves and their peoples themselves take upon them effectively. So they have entrusted the Union with these uh, policy fields. So we must make sense of these, this relation between objectives and means. And that is the core of our competence jurisdiction, whether it be vertical or horizontal, and even in the fundamental rights protection, when we have to weigh up limits to the exercise of some fundamental rights, it will be in view of an objective of the general interest, proportionately pursued, and this, according to the three-step German thing, geeignet, erforderlich, angemessen. <laughs> That's the, that we took it over from Germany, which means appropriate, necessary, and proportionate in the strict sense. All of that is purpose-driven at the start, but that purpose is textually let down in the text of the treaties, in any regulation, in any directive of the European Union. And that gives also some legitimacy to what we do. Yes, it is, of course, inscribing itself in a political context. But at the same time, that context is given by the political process itself at the appropriate level. The member states for the treaties, the legislative process for the text under that. Thank you so much, uh, Justice Greer. <laughs> number, number one. I, I will learn someday. Okay. Germany had a fierce debate on methodology in the Weimar Republic, 1920s. Uh, this is still worth being read, and the most important yeah. contributions exist in English. This is over. We have now a rather firm consensus about methodology, which I cannot describe in length, but it is... There's no originalist in Germany. There is no formalist yeah. or positivist in Germany. <laughs> it's a substantive approach, sort of a purposive, value-oriented uh, uh, approach. Number two, dissents, because I think this is an important uh, point. If we agree, and I think almost all of us will agree, that a norm of the Constitution or any legal norm does not fully determine the application to a concrete case, if we agree with that, that means that there is always more than one correct solution to a case. And if this is so, I would say we should lay it open. Uh, that's to say the disagreement within the court, in, within the range of a legitimate answer, should be laid open. And with a vote to you, I think it would not hurt the authority of the court. Yeah. A, a democratically ripe society can endure that, that there is not only one correct answer. No. Difference between the United States and Germany, we have the dissenting opinion, only the Constitutional Court has it. We make rare use of it. I wrote in my 12 years on the court two dissenting opinions. This, and, and don't believe that these two cases were the only ones where I was in the minority. <laughs> this is what the Supreme Court justice does every week. And uh, uh, maybe there is good reason to think 
is it really necessary to pronounce every disagreement that one has? Thank you very much. And Justice Abela. I knew you would throw out a question like that. He's been provoking me on constitutional theory ever since I met him. <laughs> and it's a very fair question. And I don't know, I have never been able to put into words what the governing um, theory is because I find it does vary with the cases. But my overall constitutional approach is what do I think a constitution is for? Whom does it serve? Uh, it's an aspirational document. The text is the beginning of the conversation. History matters. It's not, I mean, the Americans seem to be buried in this dispute about text and history and, and the extent to which they are uh, relevant, overriding, paramount. It's just part of our background, like every other Western democracy. Um, and when we started our Charter of Rights, our Constitutional Protection of Rights conversation, it was 1982. Originalism had not made an appearance. I mean, I, I know that Ed Meese made his speech in 1985 saying our intention is uh, to have a constitution that's interpreted in accordance with the intentions of the drafters, uh, promoters, and ratifiers of the <coughs> constitution. Well, in 1985, the Supreme Court of Canada, who had a, do a constitution since 1982, was asked to interpret the Section 7 right of life, liberty, and uh, security of the person. The framers in 1982 made it very clear that they thought that was a procedural pr protection. And the then Chief Justice wrote, I know that's what they wanted. That's not what they're getting. We think it's procedural <laughs> and substantive. And that was the last time we ever had a discussion about whether or not originalism had any relevance. And the problem, <laughs> the problem with originalism as, as it is sometimes applied, and not everybody on the American Supreme Court, by, I mean, you do have diversity of, of views. The problem is that it's a bow to tradition. And when you bow to tradition, a constitution can't grow. You can't have originalism when you're thinking about segregation or the rights of women um, and the use of history to either justify striking down abortion as was done in Roe or fighting uh, gay marriage as was done in Ogrefell isn't helpful. But if you look at constitutions as what are you trying to protect, the dignity of people, the rights of people, in a post-World War II context, despite the geopolitical shifts going on around the world, which makes, as Dieter says, our job even more important, not, I mean, <coughs> stability, but not stagnation. We have to protect those values that our constitutions were developed to protect. Will it depend on the case? Yes, of course. I don't know what freedom of expression means every time. Yes, I do. Yes, I do. Okay. You are great. You are no, great. We're, we're so obedient. They are wonderful, they're and they're afraid of the beep beep. So I thought, I thought maybe we'd collect a couple of questions uh, from the audience, Mark. Is that okay? So my idea is to see who would like to ra raise a short, concise question, and we'll collect a couple of them, and like then the let anybody on the panel who wants to address it. So don't be shy. So let me congratulate the audience on a yeah, very good question. And I, I will suggest that each member of the panel pick only one or two. And um, if you each take just under three minutes, we can get through within our time. Okay? Would you like to go first, um, yeah. Mr. President? Well, thank you. First on conflict avoidance. That was really a question music to my ears because <laughs> I think that is what a constitutional court, including our court in that capacity, always do, always does. That is to say, you interpret the rule whose constitutionality is to be checked. And what often happens is that the case is brought challenging the legality of uh, the constitutionality of a law say an EU directive, that our court interprets the directive in a way that it can conform to the constitutional standards. And then, although the applicant loses the case, it in fact wins because it has consolidated 
a, a legislative interpretation which is then uh, avoiding the problem raised. It's not always possible, but it is done to a far, far greater extent than it is often thought. Now, that picks in also on your point, and on your point. The stable constitution, but a constitution which doesn't stand still, Roscoe Pound. And your question did me think in relation to that, to what was once assigned as an exam question to me uh, by Lauren Stripe in my LLM year. Uh, this is a constitution we are expounding, exclamation mark. Chief Justice Marshall, McCulloch versus Maryland. And that's exactly what we're speaking of. The words are the words. But sometimes the words will not remain sufficient because society has developed. So you have to give, on the basis of text, context, and objectives, uh, a meaning in present day terms which reflect the value system underpinning the Constitution. And that's the proper task of judging. That is to bring to the surface what has been maybe underneath, hidden, but very really there, and to make it live. I will never forget the case, um, the Connecticut case, eh, where Justice Goldberg said the penumbras of the Constitution to recognize the right to privacy. Privacy was not even mentioned. Now in Europe, privacy is mentioned in the European Convention on Human Rights, but not yet personal data protection. That's mentioned in the Charter of Fundamental Rights of the European Union. So you see how the things go. United States Constitution, 200 years old, a bit more, does not even have privacy. You got it judicially. A much more recent text in Europe has privacy, 1950. The 2000 Charter has privacy plus personal data protection. So we must make that living reality when interpretation goes on. Thank you. Who would like to go next? <clears throat> Professor Grimm? I would really like to answer all these questions. I know you have <laughs> two, two and a half minutes. <laughs> two and a half minutes. <laughs> uh, how, do we, how do we reconcile fundamental rights that conflict with each other? by using proportionality. Mm. Is your proportionality uh, an, uh, an operation this is, that is no longer legal but political? Mm. I think if it is correctly done, it remains in the realm of yeah. a legal uh, operation. I think we would all agree a limitation of a fundamental right that cannot even reach its purpose cannot be upheld. A limitation of a fundamental right for which a milder means exists that reaches the purpose in the same way, the old one cannot stay. So all criticism goes to the final element, the balancing. And then everything depends on what do we balance. Very often there are misunderstandings. We balance the big values, liberty versus security. This never happens in court. In court, these things come in a small portion. We have one law that limits a fundamental right a little bit in order to give a certain uh, uh, gain for the purpose, for the legal good that is behind the limitation. Uh. So if we identify these elements as precisely as possible and then compare the gain and the loss, the loss for the fundamental right, the gain for the other legal good, this can be done without leaving the realm of the law and without uh, uh, politics. Uh, one, one word to China, uh, only because in the last uh, three or four years uh, I taught uh, intensive courses of one week on comparative constitutional law in China. In the last two years, I think, uh, the question mostly asked was, how can we get a constitutional court in China? How can we convince the party that this would be a good idea? And my answer is, I'm afraid, the party will not be convinced that this is a good idea, but you can make it easier for the party to swallow that. And I said it contre coeur, so to say, adopt the, Canadian, adopt the Canadian rule that Parliament can override a decision of the Constitutional Court. But I added, 
In Canada, the government doesn't make use of it. I'm not sure whether this would be the case in China. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> Chief Justice yeah. Ngovo, yeah. Okay. The, the rights that are in the Constitution will remain meaningless unless those who need them the most have access to court where they can vindicate those right. rights. Two provisions in our Constitution which are critical. The first one is guarantees to everyone the right to go to court. The second one gives any person to litigate on behalf of, on, on behalf of anyone who for any reason whatsoever is unable to litigate on his or her behalf. So in a sense, it makes sure that interest groups, public interest law organizations are able to edge rights on behalf of the poor and those who can access this. Sometimes matters come to, to court, for example, where you feel that the person require representation, everyone has the right to legal representation. If he can afford that, if the person cannot afford, the state must then pay for that. Yeah. There was a question about the president, which I wanted to, what was the question? Could you stop the watch at the moment? <laughs> <laughs> it was about the president. president. Yeah. So what are some of the considerations Okay, very well. I've never overturned any precedent, and I hope no one overturned mine. But, <laughs> <laughs> but let, let, let me tell you about a case. This was decided in 1897. The issue in that case was whether courts have the power to review legislation for constitutionality, whether parliament, Congress at the time, is bound by the Constitution or whether they can make any law. The first decision was given by Chief Justice Kotz, I think it was, and he took the view that the Const Congress is above the Constitution. They have no reason to follow the Constitution, they can just amend it. Okay? Later on, he changed his mind and said, I was wrong. The Constitution is supreme. Judges have the power to review statute, and therefore I'm asserting that part. He was fired thereafter. <laughs> <laughs> a cautionary tale. A cautionary tale. Uh, Justice Cepeda? Thank you. Uh, taking from your question, in constitutional litigation in Colombia, we took the decision of getting rid of the lawyers. So you don't need a lawyer to access court, even the constitutional court, to raise your constitutional issue. Of course, lawyers collaborate. The second principle is free. You have to pay anything. So the, we consider that there is a right to the Constitution and that every citizen has a right to control power and make it accountable to the Constitution. This raises the issue in a poor society with inequality and poverty on how to handle cases that are very relevant for the poor. And even if they can access the court, they rarely do so. So we have, uh, of course, we, we decide case by case when there are very important powers involved. But when there are poor people involved, we think that there is an ethical dimension in the passage of time. So you have a very poor person, an IDP, an internally displaced person that gets to the court, but there are three million IDPs. Should you render a remedy just to protect one, or should you accumulate all the cases and protect the three million and a half with a structural injunction as, Mar as happened in Brown versus Board of Education? So there are things in the US that we look at and that we value very much. So we have a lot of structural remedies to protect simultaneously a lot of people. And we have a doctrine. The doctrine is a state of unconstitutional affairs. So we don't look to the administrative acts or to the statutes. 
we look to the reality, to the context, and we see if in the context the effective enjoyment of the rights, effective in reality, are being affected. And so in this context, the court intervenes, of course, look at policies, but not to change the policy, but to draft a remedy that protects the principle and throws the ball back to the political process to design policies that are aimed at the effective enjoyment of the right for a lot of people, not just the litigant. Thank you very much. And we are going to give the final word to Justice Abela here. And I want a good mark from Professor Michaelman when I finish. <laughs> ah, well, let me start by talking about what we do like about the American constitutional interpretation. It happens to be a little bit far back. But what the Americans used to do very well, I thought, in, Amer in constitutional interpretation was the freedom from jurisprudence, the freedom from an unreasonable state. And that's part of your political origins, Law Cobb, Humes. Uh, they all came here with the idea that the state was unreasonable, keep it out. So your criminal law jurisprudence in the 40s, 50s, helping us figure out when the state should be kept at bay was really, really helpful. Um, not so helpful uh, in equality because the 14th Amendment is also seen as a freedom from, and that means you treat everybody the same, which means somebody in a wheelchair gets treated as somebody who's able-bodied, and we see equality as a human rights freedom from discrimination doctrine, which is more like your Title VII Griggs versus Duke Power approach. And we also see speech very differently because uh, we protect people from hate speech because we have the civil libertarian and the human rights, the rights of the individual, the rights of the group, which seem to be an allergy for the courts here. They don't like protecting group rights, so they get nervous about affirmative action, stuff like that. What will the courts say? What will happen in 200 years? I think they'll say a Bella who. <laughs> um, <laughs> tradition, the role of tradition. It's a very interesting question. If you, I'm a, I was born in 1946, so I was born when the world was looking at what should we do about international law? And Lemkin and Lauterpacht, two law professors, came up with two brand new theories of international law, which would not have been possible if we'd said, well, we've never done it that way and we have to adopt precedent. So they said there should be genocide and there should be crimes against humanity, even if it's committed against the citizens of your own country. Boom, there goes Grotius, 1625, <laughs> domestic sovereignty, bye, no more. So the law grows, and so we look to tradition, but we're not slaves to tradition, which brings me to precedent. So precedent is very important because um, I see courts as players. I think there's, to pretend we're not, whether we say in Dred Scott that uh, African Americans don't have rights, you're a player. And when you say they do in Brown, you are a player too. And if you start saying, is this going to be too provocative, you're just, you might as well just resign because you're not going to be doing your job. So Canada, in the last five years, overturned 25-year-old decisions on assisted, no. I want to, I want, Ten more seconds. Uh, okay, assisted, assisted suicide, prostitution, and uh, freedom of association. I want to end with dissent because this is very important. I cannot imagine a court that doesn't have dissent. I, we have nine judges on our court the way the Americans do. I say it's like being married to eight husbands. And if you know, if you know how hard it is to make a decision with one about where to go for dinner, and then think that eight strangers who didn't pick you and you didn't pick them have to discuss the most important decisions of the country together every day, I think it's a marvel that we have unanimity from time to time. Well, I, I hope you will join us in thanking uh, a wonderful panel.